Good morning. Welcome to worship with the Unitarian Universalist Church of Ventura. I'm worship associate Sue Frinkmeyer. Our minister, the Reverend Dana Worsnop, is under the weather today. Sorry. <laughs> we wish you well, Reverend Dana. Not wanting to infect any of us, she has stayed home and will deliver the homily from there, so you'll get to see she's okay. And I am delighted to be here to assist my fellow worship associate, Celia Ortenberg, with the service. We gather to keep love at the center of our lives and at the center of the way we move in the world. Whether you have been here 30 years or three, 10 months or 10 minutes, and whether you strolled, rolled, zoomed, ran, or danced in, we are so glad you have joined us. We are a community of many beliefs, identities, origins, sexualities, genders. All are welcome here. We preface our service by acknowledging our building rests on the ancestral homelands of the Chumash peoples. Let us pause and remember that we live on ground that is sacred, ground that cries out for justice and for responsible stewardship. In so remembering, may we find the courage to do our part to restore wholeness to the earth and all her peoples. A few brief announcements. We have 185 items for this year's auction. Yay! <laughs> One of the things you can bid on at this service, at the auction, is a sermon on a topic of your choice. This service, as it happens, is the topic selected by winning bidder last year, David Frank. Thank you, David. <laughs> Our Mardi Gras theme party, kickoff party, will be October 7. Tickets will be on sale in Berg Hall, our community hall, right through those doors during coffee hour today and also next week. They're $13 now. But after next week, after October 1, they go up to 18, so get your tickets. The party will give a chance for all of us to wear our favorite Mardi Gras outfit, should you have one, listen to live jazz music from the Ventura High School Jazz Quintet, play some games, and bid on live auction items. For kids, we'll have a live bouncy house, a snow cone machine, and more fun activities. The fun just rolls on. This coming Tuesday, September 26, we're returning to Women's Potlucks. It will be at 6 p.m. in Berg Hall. Come one, come all to meet, greet, and eat together. There'll be spaces to dine both indoors and out, especially for those outdoors wanting to be more comfortable being outdoors. Bring a dish to share and your picnic wear. The green room gallery right back there, the exhibit is changing, and today is the last day to apply to participate in the next exhibit. Pick up an application at the Connecting Center in Berg Hall, again, right through those doors, and put it in the envelope there before you leave. And last, but certainly not least, for those of you on Zoom, Reverend Dana will be joining our breakout rooms after the service today. Now, breathe with me. Arrive fully here together. Let us enter sacred space. I'm Worship Associate Celia Ortenberg, 
and I invite those of you who are Zooming or streaming into this service to light a chalice or a candle at home as Sue lights the chalice of our free faith here in the sanctuary. We begin our service this morning with these words from Reverend Sarah Stewart. To remember our promises. Bring who you are as you enter our church this morning. Bring your best self and your struggling self. Bring your mistakes and your triumphs. Bring your shortcomings and your recommitment to good. Bring, your, bring yourself here and open your heart to beauty, to truth, to the door that is open to the presence of God. Here in this church, we are trying to walk together on the peaceable way, trying to hammer out division and hatred and all that separates one from another. We try and we will fall short, but head but held in love, we try again. We come together this morning as a church to bow our heads in prayer, to raise our voices in song, to remember our promises, and vow to live by them once again. Come, let us worship together. Good morning and welcome everyone. I'm Carolyn Bierke, the music director, and I want to welcome you all here in the sanctuary and online. Our opening hymn is a little song called Peace, Salam, Shalom. That's all of the words for the whole thing, and we're going to have some fun with it. Peace, Salam, Shalom. The choir is going to sing it a couple times, and when you get the, get the hang of it, you can join in, and then we'll stop and we'll, we'll try it as a round. So if everybody would please rise. Um, the choir will start. Once you get the hang of it, just go ahead and join in. Two, ready, go. Peace, Salam, Shalom. Peace, Salam, Shalom. is that joyous time when we invite all of our young people and those young at heart to come forward and join us up front for a story. Yay. Why do they call it what? Mm. It 
is so good to see the number of young people and those young at heart continuing to grow. I love it. It's good to see you. I want to share with you today the hardest word, a young kipper story by Jacqueline Jules, illustrated by Catherine Janus Kahn. You can watch the scenes up on the screen if you like. A long, long time ago, the world had many large and fabulous creatures. One was a gigantic bird with dark red wings and a purple feathered head. He was called Ziz. Sadly, Ziz's great wide wings blocked the sun like a dark rain cloud. Every time Ziz flew over a town, all the parents would call to their children, come inside quickly. Not wanting to spoil the children's playtime, Ziz started flying around at night when no one would notice how dark the gigantic wings made everything. But one night, Ziz flew too high and bumped into a star. Sizz, oh yeah, no, <gasps> sizzle, pop, snap, bang, the star fell out of the sky and down to earth. It burned a big hole in the ground. <gasps> what a disaster. But then Ziz had an idea. Ziz knocked a cloud down out of the sky. Plop. The cloud was full of rain and filled the big hole with water. Now, it was a lovely pond, perfect for swimming. The children came running to the pond with delight, splashing and playing in the water. One day, however, Ziv made a Ziz made a mistake that could not be fixed. A week before Yom Kippur, Ziz was soaring along and flew smack into the tallest pine. The tree fell over and knocked over another tree and another and another, which fell on the children's vegetable garden beside the synagogue. Smash, squash. Oops, Ziz couldn't look. Oh, tomatoes, corn, pumpkins, beans, squash, all smashed to bits. I can't knock down a cloud and fix this. I have to go have a chat with God about this. Ziz flew up to Mount Sinai, always the best place to talk to God. It was so high, Ziz's purple head reached right up into the heavens. What have you done this time, God asked Ziz. This was not Ziz's first trip to Sinai after making a mistake. Oh, I knocked over a big tree into another tree and smashed the children's vegetable garden. I can't knock down a cloud to make this better. No, you can't, God agreed. So I want you to do something for me. Anything, said Ziz. I want you to search the earth and bring back the hardest word. The hardest word? Yes, said God, now go. Ziz stretched huge wings, flip flap, the biggest bird searching for the hardest word. Flew over the trees, valleys, and seas. After a whole day, Ziz stopped to rest at the edge of a forest. In a little house nearby, a parent and a child were arguing. I don't want to go to bed, said the child. You need your rest, the parent said. But I'm not tired, cried the child. Good night, said the parent, closing the door. That's it, thought Ziz, who flew as fast as possible back to Mount Sinai. Ziz landed on the mountain and poked a purple head through the clouds. I found it, Ziz cried. The hardest word is good night. Every child hates it. Is that true? No. No! <laughs>
Ziz is wrong. <laughs> Ziz danced atop Mount Sinai, how, Mount Sinai, how he loved being right, but we know he's wrong. Good night is a hard word for children, God agreed, but there is another word even harder. Ziz slumped over, disappointed. Go and find it, said God. Once more, Ziz spread out mighty wings, flying over mountains and trees, over valleys and seas. Flip, flap! The biggest bird flip flapping, looking for the hardest word. Ziz searched three more days and brought back lists of words to God. Words like rhinoceros, ridiculous, and rumpelstiltskin. <laughs> By the evening Yom Kippur, Ziz had collected over 100 words, and God did not accept any of them. <sighs> Ziz decided to have one more discussion with God. What word did you bring this time, God asked. No word, Ziz said quietly. I've come to say I'm sorry. I can't find the hardest word. You're sorry, God asked. Ziz nodded, yes, I'm sorry. You found it, the hardest word, said God. I did? Ziz was confused. Yes, the hardest word is sorry. Of all the words you brought me, sorry is the hardest. I always say I'm sorry on Yom Kippur, Ziz said. Well, you should say it at other times, too, said God. Like when I smashed the garden, Ziz asked. That's right, said God. Ziz pulled a purple feather, his purple feathered head out of heaven, spread great wings and flew to the children's garden. On the way, Ziz gathered a big basket of fruits and vegetables from the garden at home for the children. It was time for Ziz to say the hardest word. What do you think, guys? Is it hard to say sorry? Sometimes, but do you say it anyway? Yes, because that's how to fix it, right? At least it's a good, good, good start. Let's all stand, face the center aisle, and sing these gorgeous young ones out to their religious education classes. We'll build a bridge of love. We hold you in our love. That was great, Sue. <laughs> what a wonderful story. <laughs> Each Sunday, this congregation gives away our collection to an organization in the larger community or to funds that help people in our own church. Those at home have two ways to give through the link posted in the chat and by texting from your phone that will be on the next um, screen. Folks present can text to give or you can still write a check or give cash um, and then drop it in the basket at the back of the sanctuary at the end of the service. Our offering today goes to Quilt Project Gold Coast, a locally based nonprofit that meets right here in Berg Hall on the second and fourth Wednesday of each month. Their mission 
is to make memorial quilts that raise um, HIV, AIDS awareness, to remember those lost to the disease, and to help survivors cope with their loss. Did you know that nearly 50,000 people um, become infected and nearly 13,000 people die from AIDS in the United States every year? The Quilt Project has speakers, has a speakers bureau, and they issue, issue a quarterly newsletter. Their quilts have been displayed as pictured here in Washington, D.C. Go away. Oh, well. Here we go. Sus anyway, <laughs> in Washington, D.C., um, in churches, fairs, synagogues, coll um, colleges, and festivals. Um, if you see, look over here, you see some people that are volunteering right here in Berg Hall. There's Gudrun, there's Andy. Um, oh, and, and I'm there too behind one of the masks. And I'm also honored to be in, um, on the board of this wonderful organization. So I thank you for giving generously, as you always do. We are grateful for the generosity of this congregation that weaves a tapestry of love that we call community and wraps around all of us. We build community each week when we share joys and sorrows. We take time in our service to do that. 
we drop stones in water, symbolizing as the ripples go out the way anything that touches the hearts of one of us travels throughout the community to touch us all. I invite you now to speak into the gathered community or write into the Zoom chat the names of those you wish to celebrate or memorialize or those in need of the loving embrace of this beloved community. Celia will now place one final stone in the water for all the joys and sorrows just shared and those yet unspoken in the silent sanctuary of our hearts. May we be truly grateful for all that is our life. Our middle hymn is based on the ritual of atonement in celebration of Yom Kippur. We will sing a response each time to the spoken word of, the, of Sue and Cecilia. Cecilia, sorry. Um, we sing, we forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. And let's just sing that once so we're ready. It goes like this. We forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again. For remaining silent when a single voice would have made a difference. We forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For each time that our fears have made us rigid and inaccessible. We forgive ourselves. For each time we have struck out in anger without just cause. We forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For each time that our greed has blinded us to the needs of others. We forgive ourselves and each other. For the selfishness that sets us apart and alone. We forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For falling short of the admissions of the Spirit. We forgive ourselves and each other. For losing sight of our unity. We forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For those and for so many acts, both evident and subtle, which have fueled the inclusion of separateness, the illusion, I'm sorry, of separateness. We forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. We offer a reading in two voices by Amanda Udis Kessler. Forgiveness. It may be the hardest thing we will ever do. Caught up in our self-righteousness, honing our pain. The one who offended may not deserve forgiveness. 
and we are not obliged to offer it. Why then should we forgive? Because we all caused pain. Because we all missed the mark. Because we can deepen our souls if we forgive because restoring even one relationship heals many hearts. Because we would be forgiven ourselves, because drawing closer to one another builds our communities, because the alternative is endless bitterness, because the world we seek to create is a world filled with forgiveness, because we need not remain caught up in our own self-righteousness and pain. It may be the hardest thing we will ever do. Let us take the first step now. I invite you now into a time of stillness. Close your eyes and soften your gaze. Sit quietly and notice your breath. Let it fall into a natural rhythm. How do you need to be forgiven? What do you need to forgive? What will you remember? What will you let go?
Oh, wow. Thank you, choir. And it is so good to be able to be with you. I'm sorry I am not there in person. Um, and uh, I am not feeling as horrible right now as I felt this morning and um, still think this was the best way to go. So it is good to be able to be with you through the miracle of the wonders of technology. It's not actually miraculous anymore, I don't think and the gift of so many people who um, stepped up and helped out in, in this moment. So it is so good to be with you. Religion is our human response to the dual reality of being alive and having to die. When I first read those words by Forest Church, so many things clicked into place. They helped me understand my own spiritual and religious journey. Because of them, I do not balk at calling Unitarian Universalism a religion. Indeed, I have a deeper understanding of the religious impulse in myself and throughout human history. Religions are ways that we humans have created to help us navigate our paradoxical, messy, confusing, bonkers existence, all the while knowing that we will not make it out alive. And in the meantime, trying to have some sense of purpose, happiness, love, meaning, I do not take any religion as literal truth, though I am in awe of the many ways that, that humans have come to navigate the chaos and find beauty, truth, and meaning in the midst of the great joys and sorrows that grace our lives. We have a capacity for a love and nobility that is stunning. We also screw it all up on a regular basis. We long to be good and kind, and we still hurt ourselves and each other. So what are we to do about all the ways that we fall short? Every religion has some ritual of confession and reconciliation to answer that question, to find a path to forgiveness of ourselves and others, a path of accountability and reconciliation. Though it has been wildly abused in practice, in its ideal, the Catholic ritual of confession has the potential to be so lovely. A flawed human. A flawed human did something they feel really badly about. They are truly contrite. And they confess to a priest 
priest who offers God's forgiveness, a path to make amends is presented, all is forgiven, and the flawed human goes forth feeling lighter and hopefully a little wiser. What an incredible gift. Of course, the practice got a little bit, little more than just corrupted because, well, humans. Yet the impulse to forget toward forgiveness and reconciliation is real. The Hebrew word for sin that is used most often in the Bible is an archery term, which means to miss the mark. It gives us credit for trying, for aiming with good intent, even if we miss wildly. A healthy ritual of confession makes room for all our failures and mistakes and nudges us, nudges our aim to be toward being straighter and truer. At my home church in Oakland, California, we had a regular practice of confession. Yup, right there in a UU congregation. It was tender and beautiful. We sat in a circle and spoke two times. The first time around was our confession of sin, which our ministers defined as all the things in our lives that kept us from living fully, being the whole and holy beings we were born to be. The obstacles, sin as the obstacles that get in our way to all of that. After we did that, we next made a confession of faith, which was defined as all in our lives, which calls us to goodness and wholeness, generosity and peace. The practice allowed space to, for me to acknowledge the ways I fall short, the ways I miss the mark. And rather than helping me beat myself up for being a miserable slime worm, which I am already really good at, in speaking into a circle of caring and tenderness, my sins had less power, and I found my my I found a path beyond them. This practice of confession was truly liberating for me. The Jewish high holy days are, are another way to address the ways we fall short. The 10 days of awe end with Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, which begins tonight at sunset. It is a day to consider how we will make things whole. The word atonement actually very much disappointed me. The word atonement is actually a smushing together of the words at one meant. Seriously. At first, I thought someone had just made that up because it sounded kind of cute. But, and really, that is the root. That's the beginning of the word. It's nothing more complicated by Latin or Greek or Indo-European Indo roots. It's just at one meant, atonement, smashed together. Oh, well. And it is how Jews practice entering each new year, which on their lunar calendar falls in the, always in the fall sometime. They enter the new year with forgiveness of ourselves and each other, that we may all begin this new year again in love. Now, this is actually the, 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 one, the sermon that David Frank bid on and won at last year's auction. And before I left on sabbatical, David gifted me with a book called Forgive and Remember, which is a sociological study of how surgeons learn their trade while holding people's lives in their hands, literally, it turns out that this was a field study, sociological field study of the hospital where David trained in general surgery. I read the book 
And he and I had a wonderful conversation about it. He talked about his experiences. And then together we talked about how to turn it all into a homily and a whole service. It was rich and deep and fun. I love the, those kind of philosophical, theological, ethical questions and discussing them with you all. And the truth is that we, all of us, learn mostly and most thoroughly from our mistakes. I used to tell the kids that I taught that if they were really, really, really lucky, they could learn from someone else's mistake. Though mostly we only learn from our own, and sometimes we can still make the same mistake over and over and over anyway. How many of us have been there multiple times? Yet surgeons can't make the same mistake over and over. They really don't even want to make the same mistake twice for they are learning in literal life and death situations. The book has a far deeper analysis of this complicated process, but the mantra in the teaching hospital was essentially forgive and remember. This is a little different than the forgive and let go mantra that is also a beautiful practice of reliefs, but in medicine, the stakes are too high. They are higher than in most of the rest of our lives. Mistakes will happen and they can be forgiven, but only if they are remembered and learned from. Teaching surgeons face a paradox. They need to control mistakes while giving students room to make errors and learn from them. They can't let the mistakes get too big Yet, oh, if they if they oversee their students too closely, you know, questioning all of looking looking over their shoulders, sometimes literally, and questioning what they're doing and helping out, that can keep them from learning and growing themselves and also growing in confidence, at which a surgeon also needs buckets of. And yet then again, letting too much slide has literal life and death consequences. According to a couple of the surgeons in the book, their words, everyone makes mistakes one way or another. Our job is to minimize these mistakes and give people the kind of training that makes them rare. Another, the crime is not making a mistake. Everybody is going to make mistakes. The crime is not learning from your errors. The stakes in surgery are costly, and it's the patient who pays that cost. So forgive and remember. Learn and grow, and don't do that again. If the same mistake is made again and again, it's an indication of two possibilities. The resident, intern, medical student didn't remember well enough and learn from the mistake. Or they really aren't competent surgeons. Not everyone is. And it's get good to figure that out early. Either way, either one of those two possibilities for repeated mistakes is probably an indication that surgery is not the best specialty for these new doctors. So, Forgive and remember. Thank goodness the stakes of most of our human mistakes are, are rarely so high as those faced by surgeons and learning doctors, st medical students, and residents and interns. Yet in the world today, there are so many people, so many of us who are so quick to take offense. 
so quick to blame and shame and publish it all to the world on any number of social media platforms and for small, far smaller offenses. One of the things that I most appreciate about the High Holy Days practice of atonement is that it starts with the self. For remaining silent when a single voice would have made a difference. For each time I have struck out in anger. For each time my greed blinded me. For falling short of the admonitions of the spirit. I forgive myself. And then I forgive you. And we can agree to begin again in love. When we are able to admit our own failings and foibles, and even our great big mistakes, and forgive ourselves, we are more likely to understand and forgive others. When, yet when we blame outward first, it's your fault, you did this wrong, you shouldn't have, I'm mad at you. It puts others on the defensive, which then creates a, a, a downward spiral, spiral. We get defensive, we blame the other, they get defensive, we feel blamed, and it just spirals downward. And everyone ends up defensive, which is no place to spend a lot of time because it is a place of endless bitterness. And we blame and shame ourselves and others for things with far lower stakes, far less serious than many who deal in life and death situations. And I'm thinking of surgeons and firefighters and air traffic controllers. I think that this increase, if it is an actual increase in our blaminess, I'm not certain that we are more blamey. I think sometimes maybe um, it's amplified more in the world these days. But I think part of this sense of being so defensive and ready and willing to blame outward arises because the stakes seem really high in so many areas in the world and in our lives. The climate is changing. The state of democracy seems certainly tenuous. And then we see huge disparities of wealth in this country and around the world. And those feel existential, and they are in some ways, but those existential crises filter down into our daily lives and and we, we come to um, all of our life and our experiences feeling like with a great urgency that things are wrong and they must be fixed. And, and somebody else did it. Somebody else did it. And I want to get them for it. Some version of that. And yet we can break that downward cycle. And it can begin in all of our hearts. And that is what practices like the, the atoning on the, uh, the day of atonement, Yom Kippur, or confession, and all of those things. It's a way for it to begin in our hearts. Because sorry is the hardest word. And yet, and yet, what if we all said it more often? It means being personally vulnerable. And it also means being curious about others rather than furious um, at their less than perfect behavior. And sometimes their behavior is downright mean, I know, but let us be more curious than furious and start by saying, being the one to say sorry first. Sometimes behavior is, you know, it's more than just less than perfect. Sometimes it's downright mean. And sometimes it means forgiving and letting go. And sometimes it means forgiving and remembering. Remembering the harm we have caused, perhaps unintentionally, perhaps carelessly, perhaps even out of spite remembering so that we won't do it again. 
and also remembering how it feels to be forgiven and offering that gift to others. That is how our names may be inscribed in the book of life, not literally, but for another year of living and loving fully and well, at one with ourselves, each other, and that which lies beyond us, however we name it. Forgive and let go. Forgive and remember. Amen. May it be so. I invite you into a time of prayer. Holy beingness of many names and no name, essence of forgiveness, grace, memory, love. Spirit of life, which dwells within and among and beyond us this day and always. May we forgive ourselves for trying and missing and even for not always trying as hard as we might. May we forgive each other the same. May we examine our hearts honestly and kindly. May we extend the same kindness to others. May we practice saying the hardest things, the hardest words, saying them honestly and in love and saying them. And may our names, yours and mine, May all our names be inscribed in the book of life. Amen. And blessed be. Please rise in body or spirit and join me in singing our closing hymn, Peace Like a River. Number 100, yes.
Thank you for such a thought-provoking um, sermon talk topic, David, and I can't wait to see here what's going to be next, so thank you. Scrolling through Dana's homily here. I should know this. Please join me in reading the words on the screen as we prepare to extinguish our chalice. And those of you, extinguish your chalices or lights at home. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. Those we wear into our lives until we are together again. Now, I leave you with these words from Susan Mankersiel. Much of ministry is a benediction, a speaking well of each other and the world, a speaking well of what we value, honesty, love, forgiveness, trust, a speaking well of our efforts, a speaking well of our dreams, this is how we celebrate life, through speaking well of it, living the benediction, and becoming as a word well spoken. Go forth in love, go forth in peace. May it be so.